Welcome to Christian Virtual Fellowship. Christian Virtual Fellowship is a production of Allegiance to the King. Allegiance to the King is a church that meets online with participants from five of the world's seven continents. If you're a biblical Unitarian or just someone who wants to know God better, join us. We're not just a videotape YouTube ministry. We have fellowship during the week. We pray for each other often. We keep in touch with one another over social, social media. We occasionally meet face to face. And we have much more to offer. So don't feel that, that you have to be an isolated Christian or Unitarian. Join us. Today I'm going to uh, I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to continue a study of the book of Judges. Okay, and uh, is the uh, full is the full screen showing? Yep. Great, thank you. So today we're going to cover uh, the record of the first four judges: uh, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamagar, and also Deborah. But before we do that, let's go over a quick review of chapters one and two. God gave the Israelites a lot of the promised land, but not all of it because the Israelites were continuing to carry with them false gods, idols, and worshiping them. And this unfaithfulness had the consequence of God not pushing out or destroying all of the other nations. So the Israelites found themselves surrounded by the very people that they had once attacked. The Israelites lived among them. The nations became a spiritual snare, a trap for the Israelites. And I'd like to go over a few points here. First is that the military conquest of the nations led to demanding tribute from those who were defeated, which resulted in covenants. And that covenant basically is that we won't kill you if you work for us for free. Israel became like the Egyptians. They became oppressors requiring forced labor. And that forced labor became economic dependency because when you're depending upon laborers workers showing up at your fields to do the harvest or the planting or your or or doing winemaking or whatever it may be now you're becoming dependent upon the workers but it, it's not only that dependency but but there's also it the forced labor became a source of resentment and waiting and plotting for revenge and this is by the nations that had been defeated but not pushed out completely and these financial interactions led to social entanglements, and the social entanglements, entanglements became marriages between Israelites and the sons and daughters of the pagan nations. Families forsook the living God for those gods of the nations, and the living and true God was forgotten, as well as all of his exploits. But even with all this, there were some Israelites who did remember and obey the Lord God. Now, having no national leadership was not God's plan. Each, But, as it turned out, after Joshua died, each tribe was on its own. So chapters 1 and 2 both, both declare that Joshua had died. Now, before the invasion of, of Canaan, God had told the, the nation of Israel, when you enter, and this is in Deuteronomy 17, 
When you enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you take possession of it and live in it, and you say, I will appoint a king over me, like all the nations who are around me, you shall in fact appoint a king over you, whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your countrymen who you shall appoint as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves, anyone who is not your countryman. So note that it was God who was to choose the king, not the people. God wanted someone he could work with, like he had worked with Moses and Joshua. The Israelites failed to do this. They forgot what God had told them. The snare, the trap that Israel made for itself could have been both foreseen and prevented by a king counseled and led by the all-wise God. Now, in the book of Judges, there are seven what are called major judges and six minor judges. Now, uh, let us not be misled by the term major or minor. The only reason why the major some judges were called major is because of the amount of scripture that was written about their exploits. While the minor judges have anything from just one verse to maybe two or three. And so here we are, there's Atniel and Ehud and, and Deborah or were considered major judges and Shamgar was considered a minor judge. He was only mentioned in chapter 3, verse 31. Now, this all uh, the book of Judges took place over about 400 years. And the first oppressor, the first enemy, was the Mesopotamians. And those are the people that came from the uh, Euphrates and Tigris River Valley area, what we would call Iraq. And they uh, oppressed the Israelites for eight years. And then God rose up a man named Oth Othniel, who, uh, who we will read about. And then there were 40 years of peace. And then the next were the Moabites. And there were 18 years of oppression. Imagine, you know, sometimes we get into trouble and... <laughs> I don't want to wait five minutes before calling upon God to help. But these folks, they they were oppressed for 18 years, the Israelites. And then God raised up a man named Ehud. And then there were 80 years of peace, which is quite remarkable. That's a long time. And then the Philistines came up and they were always there on the border, ready to cause trouble. And Shamgar rose, was, was appointed as judge by God, and peace resulted, although we're not told for how long, or maybe he might have even existed under the, uh, at the same time that Ehud did. We, we really don't know. And then finally, the Canaanites, those who were forced to uh, work for free for the Israelites, they rose up in great military power and for 20 years oppressed them. And you could kind of notice that those numbers got from eight to 18 to 20. So longer and longer periods of time. And Deborah and, and the general Barak uh, rose up and they won 40 years of peace for the Israelites. So there was a downward spiral of unfaithfulness uh, by Israel. First, they would do evil in the sight of the Lord. They followed other gods from the people who were around them, provoking God's anger. God handed his own people over to plunderers, oppressors, enemies. They remembered God had once saved them, so cried out to him, promising to follow only him. And God had pity on them, like a father does his children when they're in trouble. He raised up judges who delivered them with God's help. And the Israelites had peace. And then after the judge died, all the tribes fell into 
the cycle again of forsaking God, doing evil, and following other gods. So here is an illustration of that cycle, the cycle that is to be found in Judges, basically three chapters 3 through 16. At first, Israel commits sin. God allows Israel to be oppressed because they are not being faithful. The sin in particular was a following other gods. I'm sure that there were many other sins and they had broken the covenant in many, many different ways. But the most noteworthy one is that they did not honor the one true God anymore. They forgot about him. They forgot about the Red Sea. They forgot about manna from heaven. They forgot about even conquering the lands that they did conquer. So then number three, Israel repents and cries out to God. And number four, God sends a judge to deliver Israel. And then finally, number five, Israel is faithful while the judge is still alive. So let's start with uh, Judges chapter 3. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all the Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan. Only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war, those who had not experienced it previously. These nations are the five governors of the Philippi, of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians, and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon to as far as Lebo Hamath. They were left to test Israel by them to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. The sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, I had actually spent many years with a denomination that taught that God didn't test anyone. So I must have been taught wrong. God does test. They certainly did test the Israelites. So God tested them by allowing the nations to remain in the land that, were, that was originally promised. As stated in chapter 2, these nations were not pushed out because the Israelites continued to worship false gods. So who are the Canaanites? Where did they come from? Genesis 9 tells us about Canaan, the grandson of Noah. In Genesis chapter 9, it reads, then Noah began farming and planting a vineyard. Well, this would be after the flood, of course. He drank some of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away, so they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. And may he live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. I think we could spend a lot of time just on that paragraph. But so anyway, we don't know what it was meant by Ham seeing his father's nakedness. So we'll read on. But it shows in Genesis 9, verses 25 to 27 that the descendants of Canaan were cursed to be servants, not rulers, over God's people. So Genesis 10 then goes on and identifies some of the tribes that were surrounding the Israelites in the book of Judges. Now these are the records of the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood. 
The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Ut, and Canaan. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Then Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the, the Hivite, or Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite, and afterwards the families of the Canaanites were spread abroad. The ter territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon going, down, going toward Gerar as far as Gaza and going toward Sodom and Gomorrah, Admar, Adma, and Zeboim as far as Lasha. So the of the six tribes listed in Genesis, uh, excuse me, in Judges 3, excuse me, uh, listed in Judges 5, four of them were Canaanites, the, Hevi, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites. These four came from the cursed Canaan, son of Ham. They were cursed to be the servants of the descendants of the other two sons of Noah and their so, okay, let's go back to Judges chapter 3, which has three of the, in, Judge, in Judges chapter 3, there are three of the four judges we will read about today. So in verse 6, and they took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. So the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Well, that's not a place you want to be. So that he sold them into the hand of Cush, Cushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. And his name, Cushan Rishathium means double trouble Nubian. <laughs> so he's the king of Mesopotamia, and the sons of Israel served double trouble Nubian for eight years. But the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to set them free. Othniel, the son of Kenash, Caleb's younger brother, and the spirit of the Lord came upon, <clears throat> excuse me, came upon him, and he judged Israel. When he went to war, the Lord handed him over to Cushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia, so that he prevailed over Cushan Rishathim. Then the land was at rest for forty years, and Oth Othniel the son of Kenesh died. So they got 40 years of peace, peace out of that, which is quite wonderful. But, you know, they did a lot of things that they that they should not have done to get into that mess to begin with. Uh, for example, they had uh, taken on daughters. They had given daughters to the sons of the pagan nations, and they gave their sons marrying the girls of the pagan nations. And of course, they forgot their God and served false gods instead. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So you're starting to see a cycle here again. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered to himself the sons of Ammon and Amalek, and he, and he went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of the palm trees, which uh, most scholars believe is actually Jericho. And the sons of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. But when the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud the son of Gura, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. And the sons of Israel sent tribute by him to Iglong, the king of Moab. So, by the way, the, the name Benjamin means son of the right, or, or literally son of the right hand. 
And, and so Ehud is or was a left-handed man from the tribe of the son of the right hand. So that's kind of interesting. So going to uh, verse 16. Now Ehud made himself a sword which had two edges, a cubit in length, and he strapped it on his right thigh under his cloak. Then he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, and it came about when he had finished presenting the tribute that Ehud sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the idols which were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And the king said, Silence! And all who were attending him left him. So he dismissed all, the, all of his people. The Nahud came to him while he was sitting in his cool roof chamber alone. And Nahud said, I have a message from God for you. And he got up from his seat. The Nahud stretched, reached out with his left hand and took the sword from his right hand and thrust it into his belly. The hilt of the sword also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade because he did not pull the sword out of his belly and the refuge refuse came out then Ehud, Ehud went out into the vestibule and shut the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them when he had left the king's servants came and looked and behold the doors of the roof chamber were locked and they said Undoubtedly, he is relieving himself in the cool room. And they said, and so they waited until it would have been shameful to wait longer. But behold, he did not open the doors of the roof chamber. So they took the key and opened them. And behold, their master had fallen to the floor dead. Now Ehud escaped while they were hesitating, and he passed by the idols and escaped to Sirah. And when he arrived, he blew the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the sons of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was leading them. And he said to them, Pursue them, for the Lord has handed your enemies, the Moabites, over to you. So they went down after him and took control of the crossing places of the Jordan opposite Moab and did not allow anyone to, pass, to cross. They struck and killed about 10,000 Moabites at that time, all robust and val valiant men, and no one escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land was at rest for 80 years. So far, chapter in chapter 3, we have, we have had two judges, Othniel, the Judean, and Heud, a judge who was left-handed from Benjamin. The next and third judge is given very little space. Uh, one verse. He has a Hurrian name, so is believed to be a convert to Yahweh and someone who isn't an Israelite ethnically. His father, Aneth, is named after a warrior goddess. The Hurrians were people from an empire north of Israel in parts of present-day Turkey and Syria and Iraq. For those of you who have not who do not drive oxen, a, gox, a ox, goad, ox goad is mentioned, and it's a stick with a spike on it used to steer cattle. Judges 31, uh, 331. Now after him came Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck and killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. And so, um, anyway, I think I already mentioned that that's a Hurrian name and that his father was named after a Canaanite warrior goddess. So the first judge was of Judah. The second was the left-handed man from the tribe of the son of the right hand and a Canaanite convert, a non-Israelite. And it just goes to show you that God is able to work of anyone despite their lack of credentials or their pedigree. And just for your information, the dark orange 
is where our Hurrian uh, existed at the time. And then the light colored uh, areas are where the Hurrians settled down. And that included the Jebusites and the Hivites. So chapter four. Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, or Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Horosheth Agoyim. The sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. So there is Chapin, the Canaanite king, and his general is Sisera, is Sisera. And he had 900 chariots. Those chariots were like the weapons of mass destruction in their time. An archer would stand next to the driver of the chariot. The archer would shoot his arrows while the driver would dodge obstacles and try to keep both men alive in the chaos of battle. You know, a chariot is best used on a hard, dry surface, not on muddy, wet ground, because the chariot can't move so fast and its wheels might get stuck in the mud. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill country of Ephraim, and the sons of Israel went up to her for judgment. And here I thought is a very artistic rendering of Deborah uh, judging under a palm tree. It's a stained glass window by the um, artist Mark Chagall. Uh, and uh, Deborah is the only female judge recorded in the book of Judges. She is a prophetess a wife, a mother, a songwriter, and a judge, a judge of the law. And she was judging Israel at that time, as well as being a prophet. So she was held in high esteem, such that the sons of Israel went up to her for judgment. She was a national leadership, national leader in, in many ways. Even today, she is highly esteemed by the Jewish community. Now she sent word and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, has indeed commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. I will draw out to you Sesera, the commander of Japan's army with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will hand him over to you. And so here is a depiction of Deborah rallying the troops, having received from God the order to go to war against the Canaanites. Then Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. She said, I will certainly go with you. However, the fame shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up with him. Deborah also went up with him. So you note that Deborah says that the fame of the victory will not go will not be Barak's, even though he is leading the tribal militias. And store, instead, the Lord will sell the enemy general into the hands of a woman. Well, you might think it, it's Deborah, but, but let's see. And here's a map of the area. And uh, on the left side, there's the Sea of the Mediterranean Sea. And on the right side, there's the Sea of Galilee. And then there's a triangle that I circled with red that shows Mount Tabor. And then below it are the words Valley of Jezreel. 
And Jezreel actually goes all the way to the ocean. It's a long, like, um, river valley, you might say. Very flat, very good for um, running those 900 chariots of iron. And here is a picture of present-day Mount Tabor. And you can see that all those are all homes, residential area at the base of it. But it has that that shape it's really kind of like a big hill instead of a mountain but uh that's where the militias of of zebulun and naphtali met barak that's where they rallied and then beneath it beneath it uh on the opposite side and well even on this side would be considered the uh, valley of jezreel and here's a picture of modern day valley of jezreel as you can see is very flat it's also known as the Valley of Armageddon, by the way. And here's a picture of the river of Kishon. And then this is how the battle goes. And uh, the good guys are the red arrows and the bad guys are the blue arrows. And Sisera uh, attacks from Harasheth with his uh, chariots down the river valley area to Kadesh. Uh, there you see Mount Tamor, they launch an attack. Also troops from Naphtali and Zebulun attack, kind of ambush them on the side. So uh, they're really having at it. And Essachar also gets involved. The, the tribe of Eshekar sends troops. So Judges uh, 4.11. Now Heber the Kenite had separated himself from the Kenites, from the sons of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Sananim, which is near Kadesh. Then he told Sisera that Barak the son of Abinoam had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sesera summoned all his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people who were with him, from Her Harasheth Agayim to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Arise, for this is the day on which the Lord has handed Sesera over to you. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. And here's a uh, depiction of Deborah on horseback with Barak going up against the iron chariots of Sisera. And you might notice at the very bottom, in the, in the above the uh, blue border there, that the earth is depicted as a lumpy, as not solid. It's a, a French illuminated manuscript from uh, the 1300s. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harothsheth Hagayim and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not even one was left. Now Sisera fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Eber the Kenite, because there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. So Sisera leaves his chariot because it's stuck in the mud, runs to where Heber the Kenite is, and finds his wife Jael by her tent. And you notice that he didn't die with his army. He didn't stand and fight. He instead fled. He, he ran away. He ran away from the battle. That's not the conduct of a good general who abandons his troops. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my master, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. 
And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a leather bottle of water, or excuse me, of milk, and gave him a drink. Then she covered him, and he said to her, Stand in the doorway of the tent, and if if shall and it shall be if anyone comes and inquires of you and says, Is there anyone here? that you shall say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and a hammer in her hand and went secretly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went through into the ground. So he was sound asleep and exhausted. For he was sound asleep and exhausted. So he died. Yeah, I think that would kill anybody. And behold, while Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. And he entered his with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead with a tent peg in his temple. So God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, on that day before the sons of Israel. And the hand of the sons of Israel pressed harder and harder upon Japan, the king of Canaan, until they had eliminated Japan, the king of Canaan. Well, we're not done with the story yet, because Deborah wrote a song about this victory, which is found in Judges chapter 5. And it's often considered one of the oldest pieces of Hebrew poetry. The language used in the Song of Deborah exhibits certain arch archaic, in other words, really old, elements, including poetic forms, vocabulary, and syntax, which distinguish it from other parts of the Hebrew Bible. And that could e even be an indication that the, the poem or the song was written even before chapter 4 was written. Well, it's not written in what we call archaic Hebrew in the same sense as like the text of the Pentateuch, it does contain linguistic features and vocabulary that are characteristic of early Hebrew poetry. In Judges chapter 5, we go into the Song of Deborah. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abi Noam, sang on that day. They're singing. They're singing to God. They're singing praise to God for their victory, saying, for the leaders leading in Israel, for the people volunteering, bless the Lord. Hear you, kings. Listen, you dignitaries. I myself to the Lord. I myself will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Of course, the words in capital letters, Lord, is uh, it actually is Yahweh. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dripped, the clouds also dripped water, the mountains flowed with water at the presence of the Lord, this Sinai, at the presence of the Lord, the, the God of Israel. And so, Deborah is referring to Mount Tabor as this Sinai, because that's where they're meeting God, because God had brought this thunderstorm of lightning and torrential rain to, to defeat the Canaanites, to cause their chariots to be stuck in, in the mud and to be washed away by the raging Kishon River. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anoth, in the days of Jael, the roads were deserted, and travelers went by roundabout ways. The peasantry came to an end. They came to an end in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. New gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel, the volunteers among the people. Bless the Lord. Bless Yahweh. You who ride on white, white donkeys, and a, a white donkey is kind of like a status symbol. It uh, shows wealth. You who sit on rich carpets, and you who travel on the road, shout in praise. 
at the sound of those who distribute water among the watering places. There they will, they will recount the righteous deeds of the Lord, the righteous deeds for his peasantry in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead away your captives, son of Abinoam. Then survivors came down to the nobles. The people of the Lord came down to me as warriors. From Ephraim, those who root is in Amalek came down, following you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Akur, commanders came down, and from Zebulon, those who wailed the staff of office. And the princes of Eshekar were with, were with Deborah. As was Eshekar, so was Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels. So these are listing all the tribes that uh, that participated in the attack. And uh, in verse 14, they mention uh, Makur, M-A-C-H-I-R, and that's a uh, area on the east side of Jordan that the tribe of Manasseh settled. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great determinations of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? Among the divisions of Reuben, there was great searchings of heart. Gilead remained across the Jordan. And why did Dan stay on ships? Asher sat at the seashore and remained by its landings. See, they, didn't, they did not uh, participate, even though they could have. Verse 18, Zebulun was a people who risked their lives, and Naphtali too, on the high places of the field. The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh, near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. The stars fought from heaven. From their paths they fought against Sisera. So Reuben and some of the other tribes, they, they had what they call great determinations of heart. In other words, they just kind of twiddled their thumbs while the war was going on. And while they could have shared in the glory of the victory, they failed to do so. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, my soul, march on with strength. Then the horse's hoofs beat from the galloping the galloping of his mighty stallions. Curse, Mirage, or Morose, said the angel of the Lord. Utterly curse its inhabitants, because they did not come out to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the warriors. Most blessed of women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. He asked for water, she gave him milk. In a magnificent bowl, bowl, she brought him curds. She reached out her hand for the tent peg and her right hand for the worker's hammer, workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera. She smashed his head and she shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell dead. Out of the window she looked, and now we're going to we're going to change the perspective because we just talked about Jael, who you may remember is not an Israelite. She's a Canite, from actually from um, the uh, nomadic tribe that of Moses' father-in-law. And now, verse twenty-eight, we change the perspective. Out of the window she looked and wailed the mother of Sisera, through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots delay? Her wise princesses would answer her. Indeed, she repeats her words to herself. Oh, they are they not finding? Are they not dividing the spoils? A concubine, two concubines for every warrior? To Sesera, a spoil of dyed cloth, a spoil of dyed cloth embroidered. 
dyed cloth of double embroidery on the neck of the plunderer. So that's interesting how Deborah's song shifts from the battlefield to um, where the uh, tribes that participated uh, are praised and where the tribes that did not participate are mentioned. And then she speaks of JL who put the general to death. And now she switches over to the mother of Sessera. So interesting how Deborah, who of course is a woman, ends the song by taking, by talking about the perspective of the mother of her enemy. So we might have thought, you might recall that Deborah told Barack that it would be a woman who would get credit for, for taking the life of Sessera. But actually we find out it's not, it's not Deborah, it's JL. Note that the mother of Sessera and how greedily she awaits her son returning with female slaves and dyed embroidered cloth to put on her neck. And one can only quite wonder, why did Deborah the prophetess put this part in? And it just kind of leads us into thinking about um, the consequences of defying God. So the fifth chapter ends by Deborah saying, or singing, may all your enemies perish in this way, Lord, but may those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. And the land was at rest for 40 years. And this verse of scripture kind of brought to my mind the verse from 2 Peter 1.19. And we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. And I just thought I'd throw that in just to bless you. So Deborah rightly sang that the Canaanite king was God's enemy. She ends this song with, with that speaking of may those who love him be like the rising of the sun and its might. I think that is just fantastic. And so with that, I conclude this uh, message. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. And so uh, I am certainly uh, interested in hearing any comments or questions or or what or criticisms for that matter. And uh, so I'd be happy to to hear from anyone. George. Hey Ray, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, I can thank you for uh, this uh, series. And um, it's, you know, when I look at from what you shared, uh, just the meta narrative, one of the things that I realize as I read through Judges is seeing what seems to be like a forewarning, an Old Testament forewarning for the church in this era. Um, as Israel went, so the church went. And as you talk about, you know, the patterns, the cycles, and um, even the fact that, you know, Judges continue straight right after Joshua. And we see very early on that, you know, uh, the Israelites derailed, and then the things that started happening. I have over time been coming to a strong conviction that, you know, in a sense, this is um, scripture foretelling to us today in this era and time to take heed to God's, you know, the ethnic Israel, how they went and 
uh, so to speak, today we're God's chosen people. And um, there is a lot for us to also learn. And so when I look at this, uh, just the broader narrative of what happened, and also some of, you know, the pattern of uh, derailing, uh, every man doing as he saw fit, you know, copying after the other systems, um, there seem to be a lot of just me uh, parallels for us to see today. So um, thank you for this sharing. And um, yeah, it's it's a lot to think about, um, but I, I really find it a uh, blessing. Well, thank you, George. Uh, John Truitt? Thanks, Ray. Um, uh, it's great teaching. I, I love the the book of Judges. It's just a really it's a really fascinating book with, I think, a lot of application for all believers of, of all times. Uh, I just want to share real quick on what was going on in Genesis with um, Noah and Ham. Hmm. Um, let me pull this up real quick in chapter nine here. Where what's really I first of all, the thing that that I think should get everybody's attention is whatever it was that that Ham did, it's interesting that Noah doesn't curse Ham, he curses Canaan, yeah. his son, right? So it says in in chapter nine, um Let's see. Oh, I went too far. Um, on verse 20, then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Um, but Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulder and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, cursed be Canaan, right? Yeah. And in fact, in in this whole section where it's talking about the, the, uh, the sons of, of, the, uh, of, of Noah and their descendants, it makes a, a point that um canaan is 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 ham, is ham's son right it, it yeah. makes this point yeah. more than once ham verse 22 ham the father of canaan saw the nakedness of his father right, right? they make it that a point and, yeah so so what's happening is to see your father's nakedness or to uncover your father's nakedness either one is an idiom for sleeping with his wife. Hmm. You find the the idiom um, very very clearly used in Leviticus nineteen, uh, where it goes through and twenty, I believe too, where it goes through a list of all of the people that you're not supposed to have sex with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, it's not all, but it's it's a bunch of examples of who you're not supposed to have sex with, and it's using this idiom. So. With that in mind, so we understand, okay, what what a, uh, a a Hebrew that's reading this that that this is a normal idiom for them. They go, oh, Ham went in and raped his hopefully stepmother, um, and not his own mother. Um, I, that's still terrible, but yeah, you know, I I'm assuming it was his stepmother, and uh, goes in and rapes her, and I I believe that. Because of the point, because Canaan was cursed, and because it's making a point that Ham is the father of Canaan, that she got pregnant. And she got pregnant by Ham and had Canaan. And that's what's going on here. Um, so, which makes the whole weird story make way more sense of why this is hmm. a big deal, why it's upsetting, you know. Um, rather than just uh, the straightforward phrase um, that he, you know, saw his father's nakedness or something like that, you know. So that, um, it's just a little quick explanation on that. Well, I, I think that that's a very interesting one because it would, ex 
it would explain why Canaan was being cursed instead of Ham, even though it's Ham that did the dirty deed. And um, yeah. I've heard other explanations, but I think yours is as good as any. Um, but the uh, one of the things I, I wanted to point out uh, in the, and I don't think I really did in the teaching, but I can mention it now, is uh, in Deborah's song, they talks about how the stars fought against the Canaanites. And, uh, you know, God has a, has set a certain order in the universe. I mean, God, God loves order. He has things ordered. And um, obviously in the situation that you just mentioned, John, uh, Ham would have violated that order. Yeah, and I just quick, I was wrong. It's it's chapter 18 that has the um has this idiom in use. Yeah, uh, of judges. Uh, Le 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 Leviticus. Leviticus. Uh, Le Leviticus. Chapter 18. Chapter 18. 18, 18 Leviticus. Yeah. And it uses it a whole bunch of times. Ah. Okay. Well then that would explain that. Thank you very much, because that that really does uh supplement the teaching because I I, I didn't want to speculate as to what it was um very good people do crazy things dan gallagher yeah ray i thank you i really appreciate it i i i, I did everything john said i love the book of judges and i especially love deborah and you know speaking of the prophetic tonight and then she said you know she she prophesied and it came to pass and I was just going to um, say the same thing that what John had said about um, Canaan, you know, in verse 18 of chapter nine says the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth. And then it throws in Ham was the father of Canaan. It was almost like because they would have assumed that Canaan was one of the sons of Noah, too. But he's like, no, 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 no. Canaan is father's Ham, not Noah. And then later it repeats it again. And I think that um, when you look at that and you see that children born of incest and the spiritual um, pollution, for lack of a better word, that happens as a result of that mm -hmm. and how that resulted in all of the Canaanites and the cursing on them. Well, look back at Lot too, you know, because there was, I think if I'm not mistaken, is it Moab or it was, you know, some of those that were the yeah. result of an incestuous relationship between the daughters sleeping with Lot. Yeah. And then that, so, you know, there's a, there's a definite theme that's running in here that it's almost like these incestuous relations result in this cursed bloodline that goes on down. So I think it's, it's really interesting. It's not, and it's not like God for no reason, just, curses someone you know like esau or whatever there's always a spiritual reason but thank you ray really appreciate it. this ray let me read you this 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 is leviticus 18 uh 7 and 8 you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father that is the nakedness of your mother she is your mother you are not to uncover her nakedness you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife it is your father's nakedness so there you go. Well, that had not occurred to me that Canaan was actually the the son. I mean, it, I knew this obviously he was the son of Ham, but I, I wasn't thinking that he was the son also of Noah's wife. <laughs> so that's, you know, yeah, and you, would, you, would, you would normally think, okay, well, if he's the son of Ham, then he's the grandson of Noah. But yeah. Noah He's not the grandson of Noah. He's the son of Ham in the sense of through an incestuous. It's not just a pure um, grandfather. There's incestuous relationship going on there. Wow. Boy, that's crazy. Uh, Steve and Phyllis. Phyllis? Uh, you... Since you all, uh, since you all uh, talk about this, I have a question then about this curse. Who actually cursed him? Did Noah curse him or did God curse him? 
it say, it sounds like I, Noah. It, Cursed. Yeah, I think, well, no one, Noah is speaking a curse, but, you know, it's almost like in Proverbs 2, a curse that's undeserved doesn't come to rest. So, you know, there's it's, blessings and cursings is an entire subject that's really interesting when we get into it, looking at how they play into the spiritual battle. But uh, people curse other people. In fact, unfortunately, Christians even curse other Christians when they're mad and they quote, pray against them. You'll hear that sometimes when churches split and that's where it's, it's so divisive. But um, a curse is when you're invoking uh, spiritual powers against an individual. And so, you know, he is cursing um, Canaan and it's a deserved curse. So therefore in the spiritual realm, it would come to rest on him. And it did. And look at the result of all of the progeny offspring of Canaan and how they were always a thorn in the side of the Israelites and in fact led them astray you know into paganism and all that so fascinating fascinating well yeah that's what judges is all about is about faithfulness and unfaithfulness and it's certainly if there's any lesson to be learned from judges is that we must be faithful to to the one true God. So with that, I think I'll I'll, I'll uh, end the recording, and uh, I'd like to end it by inviting you again to uh, check us out at Allegiance to the King, and you can find us at a2kchurch.org on the internet, a2kchurch.org, and also on Facebook, Allegiance to the King. So God bless you and. Have a great day.